broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good day, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, training specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, the APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar strategies for retention and recruitment and APS program panel discussion with Renee Bushalon, Rebecca Clayton, Kesley Wald, Kim Rutledge, and Valerie Smith. And I'll be introducing folks um, in a minute. Uh, next slide. First, we're going to go over a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, and it is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. The APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. So we're he here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide. Okay, on to some housekeeping. Um, a handout of today's slides is available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel, and you can access that at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio, and if you experience audio problems due to internet connection speeds or hardware issues, we recommend that you exit and log back into the webinar. Next slide. We are planning to have some time at the end for some questions after our panelists um, uh, present their information. Um, but at any point during the webinar, you can go ahead and send us questions and or uh, comments or sharing and feel free to do that using the questions box. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email when it is up on the APS uh, TARC website. And everyone today attending will receive an email in about 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Um, and also, uh, we, when prompted, if you could take that brief uh, webinar survey, that would be great. Uh, we'd love to hear back from you. All right, next slide. So before I introduce our panelists, what are you hoping to learn from this webinar? We would like to know. So using your questions box, go ahead and, and um, type that. And I'm gonna take some time to introduce our, our panelists. Next slide. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists who are all very, very busy people. We have Renee Bushalon, APS Program Director from Tennessee Department of Human Services and Rebecca Clayton, Dep Deputy Assistant Director, Division of Aging and Adult Services, Arizona Department of Economic Security. We have Kez Wald, Associate Commissioner, APS, Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. Kim Rutledge, Adult Protective Services Program Liaison with the California Department of Social Services. And Valerie Smith, Social Services Program Manager, APS, Department of Aging and Adult Services, County of Santa Clara, and that's in California as well. So next slide. I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to set the stage. So why this topic? And you're saying to yourself, that is a very silly question. This is a really hot topic. So we knew before the pandemic that recruitment hiring and retention was an issue, and it's been exacerbated in APS and across all sectors um, after, you know, during this, this pandemic. Um, the other thing we know is that the new ACL research agenda, building the evidence base for APS, that um, caseworker retention and reduced turnover show up as goals of research um, involving caseloads and staff education requirements. Not necessarily a study on to itself, but obviously an identification of, of further research in an issue. We also know that there are very few resources out there on retention and turnover in APS um, compare, um, as compared to other fields. But I will say that we have an, a resources slide towards the end of the slide deck that offer two more current research articles from 2020 um, on a APS specific support and looking at um, turnover and retention. 
So in September of 2021, the APS TARC uh, sent out to the listserv a question related to um, what innovative recruitment and retention practices does your program embrace? And we offered a few different bucket areas and the results were very interesting, but it also made us think, why don't we drill down for a discussion on some of the innovative approaches to tackle this tough issue? So we invited um, Tennessee, Arizona, Texas, and California to share um, some of their approaches, their success, successes and challenges. So next slide. The format of this webinar is actually a panel, panel discussion. And so each um, state will tackle these, uh, th th these questions are um, a point of a framework from which to start. So they'll be, they'll be talking to these questions, but also sharing anything above and beyond that is relevant to this challenging issue. So we asked our states, uh, when did you first recognize recruitment, hiring, and or retention as an issue in your state? And what innovative approaches are you using to tackle it? How have been, um, what have been the outcomes and, or what are the anticipated outcomes for, from your approach? And what have been the biggest challenges with your approach thus far? In any words of wisdom. So I'm going to hand it on over to Renee, um, who is going to talk a little bit about what Tennessee is doing in this area. Take it away, Renee. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Renee Bershon. I'm the director for APS here in Tennessee. Um, we've had a turnover issue for many years. I cannot uh, think of when that started. But I do know that in 2018, we started taking a deeper dive to try to understand all the issues that impacted retention as we were losing quite a few staff each year. Uh, we quickly learned that in order to improve retention, we also had to look at who, were, who we were hiring and how we were, were recruiting those people. Uh, therefore, we kind of took a multi-pronged approach over the past four years to address these issues. Uh, we started out in 2018 by staff surveys that we do continue to do annually. Um, we found that the number one need uh, from those staff surveys was employee recognition. Uh, employees just wanted to be recognized. They wanted to know that they were doing a good job and a simple thank you uh, was high on their list. Um, we then created a little, a small program that we called an employee recognition program that provided some small gifts. Uh, to our staff who had been here one or more years. Uh, for example, I think the first year we offered a rain jacket with APS logo on it that they could use while they're out in the field. Uh, we continued our efforts and in 2019, we updated our job classifications to match the current duties. We found that they were quite out of date. Things had changed a lot. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that new hires understood what exactly they were uh, applying for. Uh, we also were very lucky. Uh, we had known for years, and I'm sure it's the same with some other states, that DPS uh, workers typically make more than our APS workers. So we were very lucky. We found some money. It was a long process, but we were able to upgrade our salary grades to match those uh, that worked in DPS doing the similar type uh, work. Um, another thing that we did was we improved our efforts to connect our staff with our mission and vision. Uh, and we developed our program, how and why, that we keep on a forefront. Um, we found that we want staff who believe in our mission. We don't want staff who are just here for the salary because those are the folks that will leave uh, very quickly. Um, we continue some of our efforts with employee engagement by implementing what we call an APS chatter. It's an every other month event that all staff are invited to, it's optional. Uh, on that chatter, we uh, provide updates from state office as well as uh, staff recognition, unit spotlight. Uh, we also provide success stories, um, and we include shout outs that we've gathered throughout the month. Um, I was a little frustrated that by the end of 2019 because our turnover rate had not improved. In fact, it had in increased. So I reached out to DCS and um, one of the things that I found was it was very overwhelming for staff. I mean, here in Tennessee, we're rural, and I'm sure that some of your other states have the issue, but about 70% of our staff cover more than one county in Tennessee. We have 95 counties, and we have uh, 90 positions. So 
you know, and, and of course in the urban areas, we have more staff, but when, when we did have a vacancy, especially in the rural area, it was very overwhelming for other existing staff to have to pick up an additional county. So when I reached out to DCS, I wanted to know how they dealt with that. And so they gave me this great idea. Uh, they have what they call a rapid response team, which we just kind of sold the name, um, which is a team that would fill in for vacancies to reduce the stress and the workload off of the existing staff when vacancies happen. Um, I was able to get six positions uh, for that team. I have one supervisor and five workers. That not only do they fill in for vacancies, but they also conduct investigations of our high profile and complicated cases, such as unlicensed facilities, and they also provide mentoring for new staff. Then we moved on to 2020, and uh, we have a statewide CCR, which consists of about 19 different state agencies uh, that help us provide services for our clients. Um, I'm sure that my Tennessee is probably not much different than some of your other states and that we can't do this alone. We have to have services and programs of our other state agencies to provide services for our vulnerable adults. So we tapped into that so staff can more easily obtain services for our clients from those other state agencies. Um, and they wouldn't be struggling so much with being able to provide uh, the services that their clients needed. Uh, we created a few MOUs, uh, memorandums of understanding with some of these other state agencies. Uh, so it was in writing of how we would work well together and what each other's role was. Um, in 2020, we also uh, started some growing our culture sessions. Um, we are trying to move, what we found was we had a negative fear-based culture where staff were afraid to let supervisors know about their mistakes. Um, there was a big lack of trust there. So our Growing Our Culture session focused on moving from a fear-based culture to a more supportive, positive culture so that staff aren't afraid to let someone know if they made a mistake. Uh, we also started focusing on employee engagement. Um, we did that through um, asking the employee about their career development, uh, their communication needs, and some work-life balances. You know, try to really uh, show that we are supporting them and not just necessarily focusing on just performance. In 2021, we revamped interview questions and recruiting um, in some different ways, such as listing on Indeed and Monster.com instead of just the traditional uh, job posting on the state website. We also reached into a wonderful tool that might be available in your state. Um, it is through our EAP program through the state of Tennessee uh, that offers, uh, you know, counseling and different things for employees. But we also have um, a program called Option that provides a catalog, a rich catalog of many different workshops. They're all free. Um, there are some geared for staff, some geared for supervisors. So in 2021, we kind of focused on supervisors um, to provide them some uh, workshops um, and how to help them improve effective communication with their direct reports, um, effective team building, the benefits of being a leader versus a manager, you know, how to motivate those employees and get away from dictating to those employees. Um, and then lastly, in 2021, we started revamping our new worker training. Um, we do have some big plans moving on for this year, for 2022. Um, we continued partnering with EAP, and uh, we're offering Lunch and Learns every month uh, that focus on all staff. Uh, last year, we just did the managers. This year, we're doing all staff, uh, managers, frontline workers. Um, and we're focusing on supporting the staff, not their performance, um, such as topics like earlier today, we had compassion fatigue. Uh, embracing happiness, uh, work-life balance, uh, those type topics um, to show the workers that, that we care about them, not just their performance, um, in hopes that that will also help engage staff. Um, we also have a plan for a new comprehensive onboarding plan to increase support for our new workers and hope to be able to offer the option of NAPSA certification within that process. Uh, we also plan to focus more on intentional recruiting um, and interviewing and hiring this year uh, by working with a division that we have within our department called Talent Management. Um, another thing that we got in the works is we're trying to move to a one to five ratio uh, from supervisor to staff because we have found that one, one issue or barrier 
for the frontline supervisors to, to be able to better support frontline staff is not to have so many, right? They need to be able to have the time uh, to focus and support their frontline staff. Um, and lastly, we are planning to address uh, trauma fatigue um, and offer some training to all of our staff this year because of the ongoing stress and the impact of, challenge, of our challenging work. Um, some of the outcomes that we have seen, um, so in 2018, so I've got about 140 positions here in Tennessee. In 2018, we had 17 separations. In 2019, we saw an increase. As I mentioned earlier, it was 22 separations out of 140. However, we started seeing some improvement in 2020. Uh, that number was down to nine separations out of 140. And then in 2021, even lower, we only had five separations out of 140. So we're real hopeful that our plans are working um, and that we will continue to see uh, this, the lower uh, retention rate. Um, and some of the biggest challenges that I found was is the need to collaborate with multiple divisions within my department, as well as other departments uh, that we needed to implement some of our ideas, such as HR and DOHR, those are our human relations uh, or human resource department that uh, we had to go through to uh, revise our job duties and, and create different job postings. Um, we also had to work with budget for the salary increases. We had to find the money and find a way to make that happen. Uh, so what we did was we spent a lot of time on the front end discussing our issues with that particular division and trying to develop the plans together so that they would be on board when the time came to get the ultimate approval. Um, for example, I was able to reach out to all the different divisions in my department to gather all the different costs from HR to training to IT of hiring a new employee who leaves within the first year. Um, and then I met with budget and to discuss how increasing salaries on the front end would save money on the back end uh, due to less turnover. Um, and, and that was a success, we were able to do that. However, my last word of wisdom is don't just focus on additional money for staff. We have learned that staff are motivated much more by just than just money. Um, and we, we're focusing more on uh, their commitment and their passion to our mission. And Great. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Excellent. Thanks. So now we're going to turn it on over to Rebecca. Rebecca? Good afternoon. Very happy to be here. Um, I think both of these topics, both retention and recruitment, um, they're really two sides of the same coin, as we all know. Um, if we can't recruit, then we can't address the inevitable growth that we're gonna all keep seeing in this, in this type of line of work. Um, but if we can't retain, then all we're doing is really kind of keeping up with um, that kind of the recruiting just to stay afloat. So it really is something that we can't kind of take our eyes off either. Um, and, and it really is um, kind of a, a, a collective approach. Um, Renee hit on actually several things that we are also doing. So always good to hear um, when we have the same line of thought. So I'm gonna hit on um, a few of them, um, but um, there, we, we really do have, here in Arizona, we really do have a, a laundry list um, of, of topics that could far exceed 10 minutes um, of discussion. Um, so first off, I'm gonna hit on it a little bit. We are talking, um, we did do a, a big revamp of our job postings, um, really making them a little bit more humanistic. I think sometimes in government worlds, um, the verbiage is either confusing, sometimes a little bit strong, um, and sometimes kind of unnecessary. So we really took a look at um, those, just the way we were um, describing what our jobs were and even some of the background that's required. Um, sometimes it said things like must have knowledge of um, state government uh, regulations. And, and, and in most cases, in all, it, it, you don't actually need that. You need to be able to learn that. Um, but you don't need to have that going in the door for a lot of the positions, just depending on exactly what they are. What they are. So really kind of taking a step back and looking at it from an applicant's um, eye. Um, in addition, um, we, we created a, a day in the life type of um, recruitment video uh, so that individuals, um, when we go to job fairs, when they look at our website, they can see that. Um, just a few minutes, keep people's attention span. Um, but really in this, again, in this type of work, Sometimes you, people don't realize always what they're getting into, in all honesty, um, the things that they'll see, and that those are hard sometimes. 
Um, but so for people to kind of have enough of a sense of um, what they'll be doing, not, not just that it's all negative, but just kind of to go in with a little bit of eyes wide open and then be able to proceed so that they don't get there and kind of go out in the first visit and say, oh my gosh. Um, so we, um, we have, have that created. And like I said, every job fair we go, we, we play that for folks so that they can kind of, you know, say, oh yeah, that looks good. Um, again, additional advertising, Renee mentioned this. Um, we've been doing more paid advertising on Indeed. Um, really trying to get ourselves out there also to that same exact point about not just using kind of the state resources. Um, we had an interesting, and again, to your point, Renee, we had a similar situation in some of our rural areas where if somebody leaves, man, it's a doozy to, to backfill that person. Um, we tried a new technique um, very recently where we had our PIO office actually write an article, so not necessarily an advertisement, an article um, about APS and the wonderful things that we're doing. Oh, and by the way, we're looking for somebody um, to fill this role in your area. Um, so that was kind of a cool, um, unique approach, and it did get picked up by that um, newspaper right away. Um, more on that when we get to the, the, the challenges and outcomes. Um, we also are actually underway right now with creating an apprenticeship program. Um, and we are lucky here in Arizona, our structure, we are the social services, but also the employment agency in the state. Um, so we have some pretty good ties into kind of that type of funnel. Um, and we realized when we met with them that really our structure was already kind of set up, like almost like an apprenticeship where you have like, kind of levels you can move through. Um, again, uh, apprenticeships are kind of all about on the job training and there certainly is that. Um, you certainly, again, in, especially when you come in kind of at that entry level, level one, role you, that's exactly what all of this is you're not expected to have any of that experience so we're finalizing kind of formalizing that as um, a formal apprenticeship program that gets us registered into various kind of other portals um, and, and opens up that funnel um, for recruiting again with community colleges and things like that they have um, access into the, that type of um, database to be able to see oh you know what kind of program is out there so that one actually is, it, in a lot of cases, I think it's something probably worth looking into because it's not that, it's probably not that much different than what many folks are doing. It's just a matter of opening up that channel with um, the employment um, area to, again, uh, find the people. Um, we know there's, there's, there's a lot of people out there, people are using lots of different techniques to find jobs these days. So just having that channel um, readily available. Um, in terms of recruitment, um, we've done a lot of effort into recruitment and, and to answer the question, or I'm sorry, into retention, um, to answer the question of when did we first realize both of these were issues? Um, the answer is um, always, um, but most recently, probably about the same time that Renee was talking about, really that 2020 or that 2019, sort of right before COVID timeframe, early 2020s, um, where we, Again, this is an area we've always kind of struggled to keep up, um, but um, just really, again, kind of doubling down those efforts on saying why um, and not just accepting that as kind of it just is what it is that you're always going to kind of struggle to hire and struggle to um, to retain and that it actually it isn't all about the salary. That's a component of it. We all know that. Um, but just like Renee pointed out, um, same thing. That there's there's so much more to this. Um, people people don't tend to look for jobs until they're unhappy. Um, so one of the big things uh, uh, it, it, we've really been focusing on is, is our leadership. So our leaders at all level um, at all levels um, have been given extensive training. Part of which has been funded by some of our um, ACL grants we we've received. Um, so it's specific funding around training. Um, but also agency-wide, we've been really focusing on leadership training. Um, a lot of times people in government roles, it's just kind of natural where somebody got promoted into a role and there you go, you know, you should know what to do. Um, and, and not always given those, those tools because they just have to go right into it. So um, not, and this is not um, APS specific. It, it's really how to be a good leader, how to mentor and coach, how to, um, increase accountability, how to have difficult conversations, kind of what it means to be an effective leader and that, that crosses all levels of boundaries. And one of those things actually includes gemba walking, which is kind of just a fancy word for going and seeing where the work is being done. Um, so our staff, including myself, all levels of leadership do regular um, kind of pop-ins at our virtual huddles um, 
and um, write alongs, um, but, but really to let our teams know um, it's not just a kind of organizational structure where you're being told what to do. Um, leadership wants to hear from you, wants to encourage you to escalate issues, wants you to help you problem solve. Um, and we also actually, I personally regularly review every resignation that we get um, in order to, to kind of mine a little bit in terms of what happened here. So was it a bad hire? Was it, is there some, any trends around our, um, a particular supervisor, anything like that, just to really understand anybody who walks out the door and, and that we kind of have to start over, you know, that's a loss. Um, and more times than not, not always, but more times than not, it's better to retain than to just have to start over. So um, we really take kind of every loss um, of an individual pretty seriously. Um, in addition, uh, one of the big initiatives that, uh, that I'm pretty proud of, um, we did some kind of um, exercises with our leaders whereby we asked them about the amount of time that they're spending in different areas. Um, and we, fig we figured out that our supervisors, because of the nature of the way things were assigned, they, in order to close the case and complete an investigation, they had to do that full review to decide if it was ready. That takes about an hour to do a good one. Well, when you do that math, they were spending 30 hours a week doing just case reviews. And it had nothing to do with, you know, really coaching or, or, or um, helping their staff in any way. So we'd established a case review team. We piloted that with two individuals just to sort of build a process, um, see how that goes. It went very successfully. Um, and so we've been able to fully staff that team now. Um, we had enough data to kind of prove its effectiveness. So not only did that help with, um, I mean, it's kind of double-edged. It, it A, helped with um, kind of our productivity and just kind of keeping that going so that, because the supervisor is obviously very, you know, doing a whole lot of things, um, but to help kind of move our investigations along. But supervisor retention, since we established that, um, established that role and to help kind of ease that burden from them, we've not lost a single supervisor to something other than um, a, a promotion. And, and that before, that was one of our biggest areas we had an issue with is whenever we had a vacant supervisor, we all said, oh, nobody wants to take this job. So um, having supervisors, the right supervisors, um, people who want to be there for the right reasons, who have those leadership skills and not just maybe super, super investigation reviewers, um, we're, we're able to really find, again, people. And we've had a whole lot more interest from our staff in, in that career ladder. Um, finally, um, uh, two more things um, real quick. Technology, we've really invested in technology. Um, we got a new system um, very recently, um, not without its flaws. Every every new system you launch is gonna have a little bit of going backwards before you move forwards, but much more efficient, um, allows our staff to be able to work more in the fields. Our old system, it wasn't web-based. So just kind of things like that, listening to them to understand what they needed. Um, also efficiency and processes. So we have eFacts. Um, we were able to bring on board, um, uh, we're, we're working on some mobile scanners um, to be able, when there's case files, to be able to um, create, uh, to be able to not have to go back to an office to scan that in and then give the file back. Um, but just leveraging technology to make processes more efficient, which also really can help people not feel like they're just down in the, the, the minutia of, of inefficiency there. Um, and um, lastly, and again, we talked about this training. Um, We've really increased our training quite a bit. We used to have new investigator training, um, two weeks long kind of classroom training. Um, we're working on, in, in April, we're gonna be launching, we've been, we've been working on for quite a while, but it's officially launching in April. That's gonna expand to 12 weeks. Um, so obviously that's kind of, in, in one way, we, we're gonna hold people back from going into the field, but in another way, um, we're giving them so many more resources. Um, two weeks is just not sufficient um, to be able to, to to feel comfortable that you're able to do what you need to do. Um, and we kind of put that back on the supervisor then after that initial classroom training, just to kind of, you know, now figure it out. Um, so that's that's a big, we, we, we really do believe kind of give, giving them all the proper tools and um, more information, um, giving them the time to work through it um, is going to uh, kind of stave off a little bit of that I've been here for three months and, you know, and I'm already out the door because, I, you know, I just, this was just kind of thrown at me. Um, and again, our ACL training grant, um, we've, we've been able to do a lot with that, including NAPSA certification um, and core competencies. So we now have uh, 50 of our roughly 150 staff um, that are NAPSA certified from that. Um, in terms of, I know I'm, I'm running a little over in terms of um, outcomes, 
it's all been hit and miss. In all honesty, we've tried a lot of things. This has been real tricky to implement anything during a pandemic and try to make heads and tails of what's really working and what's not. I would say the most successful thing we've done is the case review team. Um, that has the data to really show that um, that we're more productive, that we're, again, we created a career ladder too for other investigators um, who maybe don't want to supervise, but want to do something else. And our, our leadership continuing to, um, to want to stay on board um, and not just be totally burned out. Um, biggest challenges. Um, so when I referred back to that article, that was something we tried. Um, it, didn't, it didn't garner anything. So we tried it, um, but we didn't get any more applications uh, for that particular area. And that, that particular area of the state is extremely hard to find people in. Um, so we, um, we had to think outside the box and we were actually staffing that, um, that role out of a, um, out of a different, um, basically a different city where there, it's easier to find people and the drive is not so much that it would be um, horrendous for them. We have to explain to them, yep, when you, when you go out, you're going to be doing a little bit of a drive, but not so much. Um, but I would say the biggest, the biggest word of wisdom is really figure out who the right people are for the job. Um, we're continuing to do that. Um, and, and whatever, I guess, either, I don't want to say assessment, but whatever ways in which we can kind of make sure that the people coming in to Renee's point, um, it's not just about, as we, and we've been able to do a little bit with, with pay, but that it's not just that because they're not going to stay, not in this line of work if it's just about pay. There, there's, I mean, even when you get competitive, it's very competitive out there. So there's much easier jobs than this. So really finding people who are going to be successful in this type of environment um, in whatever ways that are, but don't, don't settle. Um, because I think sometimes when we all get a little bit desperate, we kind of, sometimes it's like, well, this is the best I've got right now. Um, and, and, and the fact is that we can't, the, 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 what we do is too important to settle. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Going to hand it on over to Kez. What's going on in Texas? Wow. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we need a panel. Um, let, I think between uh, Rebecca and uh, Renee, we have all the answers. So um, <laughs> that was really impressive. Um, I want to, I want to echo something that, that they have not necessarily said, but this concept, we're throwing everything we can at this issue. Um, and all of the things that, that were mentioned in some way, shape or form, I believe we have tried or have in place or have tweaked in, in the state of Texas. Uh, but I, I'm gonna try to be a little more focused on some things that we've done um, just from uh, the perspective of turnover, you know, and, and I think it was said earlier, turnover has always been an issue on and off with adult protective services. It's difficult work. What we ask our staff to do on a daily basis is very, very challenging. Um, and let's be honest, pay isn't everything, but we probably don't pay people enough. Uh, so we're looking, you know, back in 2017, 2018, we were looking at a significant turnover problem here in Texas, uh, running around 25 to 27 percent annual turnover. Um, it was killing us, uh, especially because most of that turnover was happening on that first year of employment. So our, our new workers were coming in, we were training them, and within nine months to a year, they were walking out the door. Uh, it was made worse by the fact that our, our colleagues at Child Protective Services, who are office in the same buildings with us, uh, had received a significant increase in pay. Um, so our folks were not just walking out the door, they were staying in the door and walking across the hall. Um, so some two things that we did at that time, and these things worked, um, we increased pay for our frontline caseworkers and our frontline supervisors by about $9,000 a year, so $750 a month. At the same time, we also started a formalized, we always had an informal mentor program, but we started a formal mentor program that was very uh, prescriptive as to what the mentor was to do and what the protege was to do and what the supervisor's role was. And we were also able to find a $300 a month stipend that we were able to pay those mentors during the time that they were assigned to a protege. Um, those two things combined, we were able to reduce turnover from above 25% to down around 17%. Uh, that lasted for about a year and a half to two years. and then. Um, we, of course, were in the middle of COVID, and when, when COVID started to ease up the first time around, uh, we saw that turnover shoot back up. And so we realized that, yes, we had fixed the problem in the short term, 
but we still have a lot to do. Uh, some other things that, that we're working on or that we've currently done is to try to match up our IT system and our case management system with actual casework practice. Uh, we are fortunate that we have a great IT system. Uh, we are unfortunate in that it was originally designed for CPS and we just kind of got thrown in there. So we have spent the last several years trying to align what our casework model is with what our IT practice is. And so that seems to be helping at this time. Uh, my staff were actually uh, applauding during the training when we were demoing the, the, the model for the first time. Um, some things that we're working on right now uh, using our COVID grant funds and our ARPA funds, uh, we are looking at significantly expanding our merit bonuses so that we are able to give up to 50% of our staff um, if throughout the state, a one-time merit bonus if they're performing well. And if we can hit 50% of the staff that we really want to retain, we're hoping that that will make a difference for them. Uh, we're certainly monitoring that and we'll be, we'll be watching those folks who do get those one-time bonuses and seeing what, if any, effect it has on retention. Um, we're also creating specialized exploitation units. Uh, what we know about our staff is a lot of them do not like to work exploitation cases. And so we're hoping that, first of all, we're adding three units. Um, uh, so three on top of the 80 plus units that we already have, they will focus on exploitation. We're hoping that we can provide a better service and investigation, but at the same time, we're also hoping that we'll take some of those complex cases off of some of the caseworkers so that they don't have to work on them. We've also developed a higher ahead model where we are using our vacancy rates to add, um, I think last count it was about 30 uh, FTEs. So we're able to hire ahead up to 30 individual caseworkers um, so that we're not killing the people who stay behind when other folks leave, or at least not killing them as much as we were in the past. Uh, we've also looked uh, really closely at our policy and COVID gave us an opportunity to see what practice looks like uh, when you're not making quite as many face-to-face -face contacts. And so we were really able to evaluate what are we requiring staff to do on every single case versus what they really need to do to make sure a client is safe. And so we've been able to reduce some of those requirements, including the number of face-to-faces that we were requiring. And we're hoping that that will pull back on the workload a little bit, help them manage caseload, and then hopefully not feel so overwhelmed that they walk out the door. Um, we've also, much like uh, my, my uh, colleagues, we have expanded our um, use of the national certification, the NAPSA certification training, and we are currently, uh, I think we have about 45 people that have gone through, and we're hoping to expand that to cover our entire workforce of about 570 caseworkers. So that's really exciting. What we're working on in the future, we're really looking at um, our training. Uh, how are we training folks? How are we making sure that they are getting exposed to the right thing at the right time and that they're given the opportunity to really work uh, parts of a case rather than just training them and then throwing them to the wolves? Uh, we, I, I would like to think we don't throw them to the wolves, but that's what they're feeling. Uh, that's what they tell us that, that it feels like when they get done with their training. So we're really hoping to, to break them in more slowly give them more intensive training on individual aspects of casework and then allowing them to practice that casework before we move them on to something more complicated or complex. Uh, we are also looking at um, expanding our reach to increase the number of interns and folks that we are bringing on board to give exposure to the work before we hire them. Um, and we're really excited about that opportunity. Um, we're also very much looking at uh, our management what are our leaders doing? How are we supporting our caseworkers? Um, yes, we have to hold people accountable, but first we need to hold ourselves accountable. And, and we've made clear, I've made clear to my folks that my expectation is that when something happens, whether it's a performance issue, whether it's a resignation, uh, or the fact that we end up having to terminate someone, the first question we need to be asking ourselves is, what was my role in this? And how do I keep this from happening in the future? So we're working on that, working on our management and leadership training. Um, and then on the uh, recruiting side, uh, we are looking very closely at that. Um, we have outsourced our hiring and our recruiting to an internal department. It's a, a, a talent acquisition group. 
that also recruits for child protective. And so we've been working with them to try to identify, first of all, who are we reaching out to? Who are we recruiting? Uh, who are we targeting? Um, and are we doing it in the right way? Uh, we're also looking at the requirements for um, a new employee. Are there things that we expect or that we require that may or may not lead to a good caseworker or a good fit with the, with the job? So we're gonna be moving forward on that over the next couple of years. Um, I think, you know, the outcomes, like I said, when, when we gave them more money and we provided them with mentors, we had a great uh, reduction in turnover. It lasted about a year and a half, maybe two years. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to get another $750 a month raise for my folks anytime soon. So uh, we're going to have to look at some other alternatives. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, the biggest challenges for us so far is, first of all, uh, just finding the funds. Uh, getting those resources together to provide those raises, to pay for the trainings. Um, the ARPA and the COVID grants have been a great help, uh, and we certainly look forward to seeing how we can how we can use those in the future to uh, to continue to target uh, ret retention of good staff. And that's it for me. Great, thanks, Kez. All right, on to California. I think we're going to start with Kim for a bigger picture and then um, Val Valerie um, for the uh, MSW stipend program. All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Kim Rutledge and I am the APS administrator for California. And today I am going to um, discuss with you on kind of the large scale, um, a big project that we have done in California around um, recruitment. And then Valerie will talk a little bit more about how it actually played out in the field. So in 2018, California APS was awarded a three year APS enhancement grant from the Federal Administration for Community Living. Um, this grant primarily focused on workforce development issues Part of the grant was used to develop California's highly successful Leaders Institute for APS Supervisors and Adult Program Administrators, which Krista was instrumental in getting up and running for several years, and we miss her every day, <laughs> but we're glad she's here. Um, but part of the grant that I will be discussing today is our APS Masters of Social Work stipend program. When California decided to apply for the APS Enhancement Grant, the San Francisco Bay Area Social Services Consortium, which I will refer to as the BASC from here on out, agreed to partner with the California Department of Social Services, which is my department, um, to develop a stipend program modeled after the Title IV E stipend program for master's level social work students operated by the California Social Work Education Center. Um, students that were going to be selected for this program would receive stipend tuition to support um, earning their MSW and a certificate in aging or gerontology from either the UC Berkeley School of Social Welfare or um, the San Jose State University School of Social Work. The stipend amounted to $18,500 per year for two years. And there was a two year employment obligation in adult services units of the Bay Area Consortium counties um, once, the, once they graduated. Um, and then CalSWEC, which is our um, state social work education center that is housed through UC Berkeley, um, was tasked with designing, overseeing, and evaluating the stipend program. And they're the same, um, group that also runs R1 for child welfare in the state and has for many years. Um, our ACL grant was a three-year grant. And so in the first year of the grant, um, CalSWEC, the um, uh, Social Work um, Education Center, worked closely with selected universities to recruit students and develop appropriate curriculum for the students, including gerontology, um, aging and disability type courses. Um, they also worked directly with the BASC in the Bay Area to locate internship placement sites in APS programs in the counties throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Ten students were selected for the pilot and started their MSW programs in the fall of 2019. All ten students successfully completed the MSW programs and graduated on time in spring of 2021. Um, because we had a 100% success rate with this pilot, which is practically unheard of for any kind of pilot for anything, 
And because our APS program in California is quickly expanding, we decided to use almost half of our first round of American Rescue Plan Act funds that we received from ACL to expand the program statewide. So currently my department, um, the Department of Social Services where ATS is housed at the state level is finalizing a new contract with the California Social Work Education Center that will expand the program to 50 students for the 2022-23 school year all throughout the state, so beyond just the San Francisco Bay Area, and then another 60 students in the 2023-24 school year. And this is really significant and really exciting because um, we have had just our APS program has really exploded in the last couple of years. Um, on January 1st of 2022, our law changed where previously the definition of elder in California for purposes of APS um, started at age 65. And we dropped that age to age 60 so that way elders can be more um, access a lot of Older Americans Act programs earlier. Um, but as a result, we're anticipating seeing very large um, caseload increases and a lot more work for our county APS programs. So right now there was um, a fairly large allocation in our state budget um, for this APS expansion and right now counties are trying to hire social workers and you know partly due to the current state of the workforce right now coupled with um, this expansion where we're just going to need more social workers, um, even though we're not going to have all of these great educated social workers for a couple of years, it's really exciting um, to know that we are going to have over 100 master's level uh, social workers within the next few years that are going to be specifically trained um, to work with our populations in APS and be committed to working um, as a part of their stipend agreement. Uh, so, to um, the biggest challenges we've uh, faced so far, and I'll let Valerie get into some of this because she's the one who actually did a lot of the work on the ground, um, was that COVID hit during the second semester of the students' first year. So they all were going from you know being in a master's program in person to um, having to do online remote learning and their internship duties and everything changed as well. Um, so I really think, again, when I, when I think about that as a challenge and then look at the fact that we still had a 100% success rate in terms of all 10 students that were in the program um, were able to graduate on time and are getting jobs in the field. I think that that, even though it was a challenge, it still was, you know, shows our success. Um, we also have had some challenges um, because we have several entities um, from a kind of bureaucratic standpoint that run this program. So um, I'm with our State Department. Um, we're the ones who hold the funding from ACL that we've been using to fund this project, but we contract with um, the California Social Work Education Center, and that is um, so we have a lot of contract delays at our state level, um, a lot of kind of bureaucratic red tape that has to be done in the process that sometimes will delay execution of certain projects and whatnot. Um, and then being able to coordinate between the Social Work Education Center, our State Department, and then we have a county operated system in California. So um, working with having the counties and all kind of working together has been has been somewhat of a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that at the same time that we're we're committed to overcoming because this program has been so successful otherwise and we do see such a need um, for more um, social workers to really be engaged in doing this type of work. And I think that even despite these challenges, we were lucky that there was already an educational center that was established at UC Berkeley and had been doing this type of work in child welfare in California for many years with thousands of social workers who have completed that program, that there was somewhat of a structure that already existed. But I would say at the same time, one of the challenges is um, our CalSWEC 
um, center has not really done a lot with aging and disability in the past. And so there's also been sort of an educational curve with them um, in terms of curriculum development, in terms of different types of needs that um, social workers that work with adults have versus social workers that work in child welfare. Um, so that's sort of a broad overview of what our stipend program looks like in California. And now I'm going to turn um, over to my colleague Valerie in Santa Clara County, who has been very involved um, at the field level with this project. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Kim, <laughs> for the for the lead. And um, thank you all for being here. Just really quickly, um, my name is Valerie Smith. I'm a program manager with Santa Clara County in California. And um, just to give you reference, Santa Clara County is often referred to as Silicon Valley. Um, the county seat is San Jose. And um, we have a lot of um, technology companies in the area. So just to give you a point of reference, if you're not familiar with where we are. Um, as Kim mentioned, uh, in California, APS, it's administered by the state, but it is county operated. So um, in keeping with the uh, California kind of west, wild west, um, there are some differences in how different counties run their APS programs, although our, our guidelines and regulations are all the same. So, and that translates um, also into hiring um, staffing and um, how funds are used in each county that are um, allocated from the state. So um, for the first question, when you're talking about recognizing recruitment, hiring, or retention issues, um, for a long time, APS in Santa Clara County struggled with getting um, the attention of the Board of Supervisors and other decision makers that more positions needed to be added. So we didn't have a retention issue. We had people who um, came to APS and stayed in APS for a long time. Um, but we couldn't ever add any to it, so and it, add any new positions, excuse me, to it. And so um, quite a few years ago, we started partnering. Um, San Jose State University is very close by to our main offices, and so we started partnering with them um, in their School of Social Work for MSW uh, internships. And so we had done this on a kind of um, county level for, for many years, but there was no stipend. And um, many of you may already know that in child welfare, there's the Title IV-E um, stipend program, which really um, allows someone go to go to school, get their MSW, um, get specialized training in child welfare, and then um, and internships, and then have to, um, you know, agree, excuse me, not have to, agree to work in a county child welfare agency for two years in order to sort of pay back the loan. So that's kind of the model we were looking at with the APS MSW stipend that, that Kim mentioned. And um, we had five of the students at APS in Santa Clara County that participated in this um, pilot program. We were super excited. Um, they were excited. And to some of the points that the other panel members made, um, what was really neat about it is San Jose State actually after students had been accepted into the program, they announced this opportunity. And so there was an interview process. And so it was really great to see, you know, people who were actually interested in specializing in aging and adult services, but also knowing that this was gonna be specific and specialized in APS. So we ended up with some really highly motivated students who um, are interested in working for the long-term in aging and adult services, which is one of the goals we were looking for. Um, all five of the students completed all of the requirements that the that the school had, um, in addition to training and so forth that that we did at the county level. Um, there were some issues uh, because of how Kim was talking about how how there were a lot of entities involved. Um, five of these students all wanted to intern in Santa Clara County, and um, so that left out a lot of other counties that had been part of the partnership. Um, that kind of put money forward for this for this pilot. So there were there were some bumps in the road about that. However, um, the students, you know, in a normal MSW program, are allowed to, you know, make choices about what counties they want to work in or what locations or what agencies. So so it's kind of one of those things that um, uh, was a little bit of a bump in the road. Um, and I think outcomes wise, so in Santa Clara County also, we've had a 
a long tradition of hiring MSW students, I'm sorry, MSW level um, social workers um, because we actually didn't have a robust training program. And um, once again, uh, our in our county, um, there was only one or two training specialists dedicated to all of aging and adult services programs. So we didn't have a six week or eight week induction program like child welfare does. We, we didn't have the staff to be able to train people like that. So, so one of our workarounds was, you know, looking at people that have MSWs because then they have a foundation of training um, and then the specific training for investigation and assessments specific to APS, then, then we felt more comfortable training from that standpoint. So um, I guess I guess one of the one of the challenges and you know considerations is that you know it this is limited to MSW um, programs. So you know potentially there could be other master's degree programs that might also suit um, aging and adult services as well. But again, we're modeling this after the child welfare, so that's kind of where we where we got that idea. Um, and I think the students are super excited. They were very positive. They, um, you know, I, I find that a lot of people when they start working in APS, they're not really sure what to expect if they haven't worked with these populations before. And then once they start working in it, they they develop a passion and are really strong advocates for um, social justice, you know, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. And all of those are hallmarks of um, an MSW uh, degree as well, so it was it was nicely matched uh, with APS, and I we actually have three of the original five um, that we have hired right now on a um, on a long term temporary basis, if that makes any sense. As we're waiting for new positions to be approved and added to our program, we're hopeful um, that that will come soon, and that you know people can then um, have the opportunity to have the full time permanent employment that they've worked so hard to um, get the credentials for. So that's, that's all I have. Unless Kim, did, did I miss anything? Was there anything else you wanted me to touch on? No, I think you covered it from your end. Thanks. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's awesome. So we're going to roll on over to our question uh, portion and we have some questions and please feel free to go ahead and send some questions and we're, we are actually going until 15 minutes after the hour for this webinar at 75 minutes. Um, so a question that came in around training. So I think almost everybody talked about training. Um, is anyone using a uh, simulation labs or simulation training as part of their their uh, their training programs? Anybody want to take that? We are in San oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> so um, Santa Clara did develop simulation labs for um, for child welfare. So we're trying to develop it. We're in the process and then COVID hit. So we kind of we kind of stopped that process. But I also know that Orange County in uh, California also has um, uh, simulation lab training for APS. Um, we do in the training, we do kind of I guess, role playing, if you will, um, and from that perspective, but um, not direct um, simulation lab. Great, thank you. Yeah, I know that that is, that is something that I've heard uh, bouncing around and I believe one other state, I want to say Illinois is, is incorporating it, but if there's anyone from Illinois on, please correct me or, or say right on. Um, Alrighty, so um, question for uh, Rebecca, how many staff does Arizona have? That's a great question. Um, we were right at about 160. Five, give or take, we're looking to be closer to about 180, 185. Great. And then quick follow-up, what position are the staff that are on the case review team? So um, great question. We um, ran it through our class in comp and they actually classified them in the same way as our other staff, just by the definition. Um, they're paid a little bit differently um, and they're not, they're not fields, they're not in the field. So I, I, found that interesting, um, but you know, you can only fight with HR sometimes so much. Um, so they're actually in the same series um, as our kind of level three um, level of staff, um, which uh, like I said, is not 
super great in the sense that it, when we look at data, we sort of always have to exclude them in our calculations because they're not caseload carrying. Um, that is something I hope to continue to work on to put them in some other um, QA like role um, at some point. But for now, you know, we're, we're working with what we got. So we wanted to move that along fast. Great, thank you. And I just got an affirmation from Illinois that they have a new simulation training. So there you go. I was, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, okay, other question that came in was earlier on. So, and I'm gonna pose this to each, each panelist. How important do the panelists feel that organizational culture is, is in the issue of retention? I, and a few of you talked about leadership and, and all of that. So who would like to, uh, Rebecca, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think that's huge. And I think it's, if you just think about yourself in, in your life, any human being, um, if the mission is really important, the work is really important, but if, if you are in not in an environment, and I think research and data and more, more and more articles are coming out about this, especially as people have taken a look at their lives during COVID and what they're really doing with themselves, feeling valued um, and having a supported environment um, is so critical. Um, it, even human behavior, you know, you can only get so much out of just kind of punishment for not doing what you need to do. Um, there has to be kind of that upside of acknowledging the positive. Um, again, that, that, that's just human nature. Um, so that is one of our, again, with some of the things I talked about, one of our main focuses is just that positive kind of quote unquote empowered environment um, to be able to, again, escalate your concerns, come to a problem solving team, like let us hear what you're saying, because especially those are the folks who are doing the work. Um, it's not up to us to decide what's best for them. It, they need to play a part in that. When people are able to play a part, they, um, they're more engaged, they, they're, they're able to feel like they have, that their skin in the game for them as opposed to they're just being told. So that is, I think, just such that going to be one of the biggest things that's going to keep people here, especially when salaries aren't always the most competitive. Great. Anybody want to add to that? I was I was just going to add, and, and I believe someone mentioned it earlier, the concept of a culture of fear. Um, and what we found in Texas is what I like to call the fear of one bad case. Uh, and we, we have parts of the state from now, now and again, where people are literally worried that they're going to have something go wrong on a case and it's going to cost them their job or they're the supervisor and it's going to cost the supervisor their job and we've worked very very hard to try to help people feel more supported recognize that you know as long as you're doing your job to the best of your ability and uh, you're you're doing your best to follow policy there are going to be bad outcomes sometimes but we can live with that uh, as long as we're doing our job and so that's that's been something that we have worked very hard on is to try to eliminate that culture of fear and turn it more into a culture of support great thank you um so if there are no other additions there's another question that i would like to to get to um and so i'm going to open this one up to the panel um and it flew away, here we go. Um, are your staff remote or in office? Do you feel like that has made a difference in retention? Did anybody wanna take that one on? Renee? I'll, I'll start. Uh, so yeah, so even before COVID, we made a move uh, to what we call AWS, so they could just remote work from home and because there's not a lot that they do in the office. Um, however, what we found was it really hurt the new staff because we were sending them home with not much support and therefore that's why we are trying to revise and uh, develop a new comprehensive onboarding plan that would provide that support um, i think staff enjoy it but there's a fine balance in autonomy right for a new worker and supporting them i was going to say our staff here in texas have been mobile for uh, really since 2007. Um, i don't know that it affected turnover uh, so or retention. Uh, I, I do believe it has helped people do their job and it certainly made them more efficient, but I don't see that it's had a direct effect on retaining quality staff. Um, our, our team went remote during, when COVID started. Um, so we had an immediate kind of improvement in uh, retention when that started. Um, 
I think we were quick to assume it was just that. And I think really it was kind of that freeze of COVID when COVID started that everybody kind of was thinking the economy would downturn and I just better hang in there. Um, and, and I have a secure job. Um, so it's not been the kind of the end all be all we've learned. Um, and I think it, to, to the other's points, like there, there's a hybrid here um, that, that probably is kind of the future. Um, the work, a lot of the work that is done is not done in an office anyway. So if you need to do your kind of paperwork, if you will, type work at home, that's totally fine. Um, but to have the, to, to manage remotely is totally different. Um, and to have a lot of our folks being social work-esque, um, maybe not that exact background, but the personal connections to your team are important. Um, so we're really working on kind of, a, again, all safety and health considerations aside, kind of what that um, structure can look like in, in, a, in a new normal world, whereby um, there's you know team building um, type of activities maybe once a week or where you're getting together with your team um, in the office. Um, you know, occasionally for certain things that really do make sense to do together, process mapping is a, is a big one. Um, so where, but by and large, um, they are they are remote and will stay remote. Great, thank you. You also touched on some another question, which is with people who are 100% work from home, how do we all address the quality of of the work, especially if that was a a quick pivot back in the back in the day? So. Anybody, um, anybody else want to take on um, Valerie? I will. I, I was just going to say, so um, we had we had a telework program prior to COVID, but it was really limited. It was one day a week and it was really intended to be like a paperwork day at home, right? It wasn't, you weren't going to go out and do visits on, on your telework day. Um, and so COVID hit and then the shelter in place and then it's 100% everybody at home, you know, which... Um, I think in the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was, you know, super stressed. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know how long we were going to be this. But I remember thinking that this wasn't going to be a long-term um, <laughs> way of working. And so, um, so here we are now, almost two years later, and and we have um, transitioned from 100% um, teleworking, which was in the initial stages of COVID, to a hybrid schedule. So. The staff are coming in the office two days a week and then are teleworking three days a week and they can do their visits and so forth. And initially, I think, um, you know, there's there's some questions about productivity about that. And I, what we're finding is that, you know, some of the workers who were more organized and on top of their work um, stay that way. And some of the ones that weren't um, also stayed that way, you know, with the, but what we're, what I'm really missing is while there isn't a, a whole lot of work to do in the office in terms of like the actual APS work, um, there's that support and engagement and interaction and consultation, um, kind of some of those soft, uh, you know, skills or needs um, that people need to do this work. And so those connections, I think have really um, have really impacted the program in terms of communication. There's a lot of siloing. There's a lot of why is that unit doing that when my unit got to do this and when we were all in the office, you know, it wasn't it wasn't quite the same way. So I think we're starting to see some challenges with um, not telework in itself, but just how how quickly we had to adapt to it without being able to think it through and put plans in place prior. But, but I do think it's here to stay, um, definitely the hybrid schedule. Yeah. Rebecca. One other thing I want to add with that we've done since we went remote is we've really doubled down on kind of data. Um, we have, with part of our um, funding from um, ACL, we brought on um, a developer to do Tableau, kind of visualizing um, information. We have reports out of systems and things like that, and that's great. But to visualize um, caseloads everywhere, um, kind of investigation metrics, um, to at least be able, again, because sometimes when you can't see somebody, it's a little bit harder. So to at least have kind of a handle on where folks are at in the process, and we continue to build new ones as we find kind of pieces of the process where it would be really helpful to be able to really see at any given time, you know, here's where somebody is, here's where somebody's at with that, you know, I need to have the conversation there. Um, I think tools like that to be able, again, to, to put those into, into um, existence in a virtual world 
um, really do at least help. It doesn't necessarily make the individual, I guess, more productive, but for the supervisor to have that information instead of feeling like I can't see them, so I don't know what they're doing, kind of finding the right data sets to be able to track that in, in a way that they can understand. Yeah, I think a former colleague called it trust but verify. Um, so, yeah. So um, we I have, would, oh, go ahead. I, can, I, I just wanted to say a lesson that we learned, and like I said, we, we went mobile. Uh, for our workforce in 2007. We spent a lot of time and energy training staff and getting them ready. Um, and a year or two later, we realized we should have been spending a whole lot more time working on managing that mobile workforce. What does that look like? How do you use that data? How do you make sure that your team is connected, that you're available, that they have the supports that they need? Um, and so lesson learned, it took us a little while, but uh, we've really incorporated that concept of managing a mobile workforce into our uh, leadership and management training. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Kes, because that is that it's a very important part um, of the, the the picture of success. Um, so we have time for one more question. There are some questions we're we're not going to get to. Um, so actually, I want to make this one comment and then one question. So someone wanted to thank the panelists um, for being so open about the issues with recruitment and retention and um, is expressing that this really feels like a massive problem um, for APS on the whole and they are wondering if there could be some sort of national work group or something that tries to pull together these best practices and provides guidance to all programs. Um, so seems like everyone's having similar issues. So I just put that out to the brain trust. Um, thank you for sending that in. And um, we, I know we've got some great minds on this on this call, and we can see what we can do. Um, okay. So for our last question, and this is certainly uh, not an easy one. Can you comment on hiring diverse staff that reflects the population that is served, um, but it, or also our competent staff? So diversity in hiring. Um, so anyone want to kick that on in the last few minutes that we have? That is a tough one. Um, I think probably from my perspective, probably everyone's perspective, our, our agency is doing a lot of initiatives around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, it's hard in a tough environment when you're you kind of are like who's coming in the door you know let me take it let me take a look at at, at them you know in in just more of the I, I need the person as opposed to you know maybe a representative candidate um until i guess you know to some degree when we get a handle on that um it hopefully opens that up but i think some of it is also around recruiting um in, in different ways. So the, the more the more that we're continuing to try to reach out to groups um, that that are uh, kind of in, in tune with different communities um, to be able to get more kind of representative um, uh, applicants, if you will. Um, but I think, I mean, from my perspective, for the most part, it's again, who are we coming? Who are, who are we getting in the door? Um, in a tough environment, um, it makes it it makes it you know a little bit harder um, sometimes to really say are we you know what are we looking like on the whole if that makes sense. Um, but but again, doubling down on making sure where our, our recruiting efforts are you know diversified in in, in in the right communities. Great, thank you. Okay, so thank you to everyone who who posed a question. We we got to many, but not all. Um, go ahead and, and let's go to the next slide as we close. So we talked about resources and um, unfortunately we didn't have time to show any of the great recruitment videos from Arizona or um, Texas, but there are links there to them. Um, also talked about the research and research agenda. So the first two bullets are current research articles, which are well worth um, checking out. And then the third bullet is the ACL research agenda, building evidence space for APS. And next slide. 
All right, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, this has been just the first of many, many discussions, <laughs> oh, I foresee, um, and much more work to, to come. So thank you all for your time and your expertise. I wanna thank you all for joining us today and, and being um, so active with your great questions. Um, and I just wanna uh, remind you that we do have a, um, well, we're hoping to see you on February 17th for our next, um, APS TARC webinar for the field, Opioid Misuse and Adult Maltreatment, Promising Practices Update from Montana and Nevada, and that's coming up next week. If you have not seen the registration notice, please give us a, a shout out and we'll help you get registered. And I wanna thank Andy Capehart for being on slides and backup and have a really good rest of your day and hope to see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone.